Our lesson this morning comes from the last chapter of Luke's gospel, the 24th chapter, starting with the 44th verse of that chapter. Hear these words. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Preachers are scared to death of Mother's Day. Any preacher that tells you that he or she is not scared of Mother's Day is not being truthful with you. Because no matter what we say, there are snakes in in their waters. And we try to walk across the waters homiletically and preach the perfect sermon and invariably we just get an alligator that goes chomp. Robert Fulgham, who wrote the book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten and wrote several other books, was a Unitarian minister for years. He preached every Sunday. He said it was the Sunday before Mother's Day and a 75-year-old member of his church, sweet old lady, grabbed his hand with a grip that only a 75-year-old mama can have and took his arm and held his arm and said, Brother, next Sunday... My 95-year-old mother is going to be in church. And I don't care what the choir sings. And I don't care what you preach. But I just want you to know that it better be good and it better be about mothers. What do you do with that? There is power in moms We watch the power from up on the stage of mom saying, yes, you're coming with me today to church. And we know the walk of shame for people who are being drugged into church. We've seen it. We understand. And I got you. I was raised by a single mom back in the 1960s and my mother was powerful. You did not mess with my mother. My mother had the most powerful right arm ever created. If you were a child in the front seat of the car and she slammed on her brakes, that right arm was automatic. It was going to protect you from the windshield and the dash. You did not mess with Katie or with Katie's kids. I remember the first sermon I ever preached. They handed me a card during the offering that my mother had sent me. It said, Dear Doug, kiss, love mom. Oh, it was so sweet of my mom. It was. I was so inspired, I preached 51 minutes. I got home. My mother said, I saw you read my card. Why didn't you do what I told you to do? All it said is, Dear son, kiss, love mom. Yes, keep it short, son. Mom had trouble with the three of us. We were, we didn't believe in the power of mom early. And one day mom went out, I don't know, she went shopping or something 
and I think she took my, yeah, she had to have taken my sister and left me and my brother in the house. And she said, okay, you two, do not throw the football in the house. Do not throw it inside the house. Which meant the second we saw those red taillights go away, the football came out and we started throwing it. Yes. We were throwing proficiently from, from one end of the den into the kitchen. It was a nice, you know, it was a nice little trail to pass. You had to thread the needle between chairs. And my brother, who was a tight end of the football team, and I was quarterback of the football team, we were just practicing away. But this was back when I was a little child. I wasn't quite there yet. And I threw a ball, and it bounced off my brother's clumsy hands. And it hit my mother's favorite coffee mug. And it dropped on the countertop in such a way that the handle cracked off. What to do? In my bedroom was Elmer's glue. The white kind. You remember it? Mm Mm-hmm. So I went and got my Elmer's glue. I've been much smarter to use my airplane glue, but I used the Elmer's glue. And I glued the handle back onto the coffee mug. And I prayed, oh God, let it stick. Hours later, I came and I checked it and it was still sticking. You couldn't even see the crack. I'd done such a good sneaky job of putting that handle back on that coffee mug. And the next morning, my mother poured a piping hot cup of coffee into the mug. And I discovered the tensile strength of Elmer's glue given the weight of coffee in the coffee mug and the heat of the coffee mug caused the handle to come off and coffee to descend into her lap. Ah, I remember that morning. Were you throwing the football in the house? Yes, ma'am. What happened? My brother missed the pass. Mom, he should have caught it. It was right in his hands. What did I tell you? So in my life, this day is a powerful day because my mother was a powerful woman and we all, whether we claim it or not, are all products of our family. We are products of our family, how we were raised, how we were cared for, how we were disciplined, how we were nurtured. And for some, that is a great strength. And for others, it's a challenge to be dealt with and a, and a hurdle to be overcome. Jesus said, I'm sending you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Greek word is dunamis. You know the word dunamis because a fella in Sweden, Alfred Nobel, when he and developed an explosive, took this Greek word dunamis and transliterated it and became dynamite. Dunamis is dynamite. Dunamis is powerful. Dunamis is sometimes destructive. Dunamis is creative. Dunamis moves things out of your way. So this morning as I was thinking about moms and the the powerful presence that moms are in our lives, and I was thinking about my mom honestly, this whole notion of power And Jesus has promised to the disciples, you are going to receive power. Just came to mind. So bear with me. I want to say four things about power. First of all, power comes from above. You will be clothed with power from on high. And in this passage of scripture, we understand that Jesus was a Bible reader. Jesus read the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And the cool verse is verse 45. Then he opened the disciples' mind to understand the scriptures. This is not a mysterious book. This is not a hard book. This is not a difficult book. If you say, Jesus, help me understand it. 
And these scriptures come alive when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, you're never going to get what's in here because the word of God, these words written on a page, point to the word of God, Jesus the Christ. This is a book about him. He's all throughout the Old Testament. Yes, he's there. He's all throughout the New Testament. Yes, he's there. He's still in the church today and inspiring us and encouraging us, leading us into ministry. And he gives us power. He gives us his power to serve him in the world, to do the things he's commanded us to do, to live out his word. I can't live out his word without him. It's not in me. I'm a football playing in the house kind of sinner. Say, don't do it. And I'm liable to see how close I can get to it before I do it. I'm a sinner. I need Christ's transformative power in my life. I need Christ to make me whole. I need Christ to lead me into faithful living. I cannot keep the word unless the word is in my heart. God gives us power from above. Power to read and understand his word. Power to live out our lives faithfully to him. Power to be the church. Power from above. Jesus also gives us power from below. Never heard about any below power, have you? I'm going to introduce you to power from below. Hezekiah is praying. Jeremiah is preaching. The people of Israel are rebelling. The Babylonians are gathering. The nation of Israel is about to disappear and go into what we know as the Babylonian captivity. And they go into captivity because they're not living according to God's word. They are doing what they have decided to do. They're they're not living with regard to God. They're not living with regard to widows and orphans. They're just, they're throwing the football in the kitchen. And they've been told not to. And Hezekiah is praying for his people. Hezekiah is praying that sometime, somehow God would overcome this army, that God would stop what looks like the death of Israel. And Hezekiah prays and God answers. And one of the things that God said is this. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. The remnant of the people shall take root downward and bear fruit upward. It's the way of saying that there is going to be power coming from those deep roots you have. I love planting flowers and ferns and all kinds of stuff. If you come to Gibson, Louisiana, you just stop and look at my yard. It's got flowers and ferns and all kinds of stuff. I just don't like paying people for that stuff. It's expensive stuff. I love beauty, but I'm cheap. So last year, I had a used greenhouse put in my backyard. There is nothing bring you closer to Jesus than a used greenhouse. It's got holes in the the cloth. The zippers don't work. It's just, it's something. But I kept everything alive through the winter. Uh, All my plants lived. They didn't thrive, but they lived. But I learned to propagate plants. You can just take a, you can actually take a hibiscus leaf and cut it, leaf and cut it in half and put it in soil and water it. Give it a little time, you're going to have a hibiscus plant. How does that plant know how to do that? You can take all kinds of plants and just break them off and stick them in the ground and give them a little water 
And pretty soon, you're just going to have all these plants. How do the plants know to do that? And you know what the plant does? Very first act, it starts growing roots. And you have this little tiny plant sticking up over the soil, and you, you, you pull the pot away, and you find this complex root system. That's growing. That's power from below. The power of your roots, the power of your spiritual roots, the power of your faith in Christ, the power that you've been given through serving in the church and working in the church and being raised in the church. Those are roots that one day will hold you up against the storm, that one day will sustain you, that one day will bring you life. That's the power of the resurrection. For three days, Jesus isn't around. What's going on? Resurrection, the roots from below. And if you need an illustration... I again invite you to Gibsland. You can come to my house and you can look at the crepe myrtles that keep popping up in the front flower bed. I planted two crepe myrtles and I decided a year later, nah, don't want the crepe myrtles, so I dug them up. I dug them up. I dug them up. They keep popping up because there's just a sliver of root. There was just enough root that the whole plant popped up. And if, if you don't like the crepe myrtle illustration, would you like wisteria? If you ever plant wisteria in your yard, it will hunt you down. It doesn't matter if you move hundreds of miles away, the wisteria will pop up. You can cut the roots, you can, you can round up the roots, you can do anything, you can burn the roots, and that wisteria is going to say, nah, 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 you didn't get all of our roots. That's the power from below. It's being rooted and grounded in love. Power from above, power from below, power alongside Jesus said, I'm sending you another comforter, the Holy Spirit, the one called to walk alongside you. The one called to mentor you, to model the faith. You're never going to be alone in this journey because I am with you always through the power of the Holy Spirit. You are never walking alone in the journey of being a Christian. There is always the Spirit of God dwelling in your heart. There is always God's presence with you. So no, no matter what you're facing, no matter what storm you've got, no matter what sin you've committed, the power of God is always present to forgive you, to set you aright, to set you back on your feet, and to set you in the direction of faithful service. So we've got power from above. We've got power from below. We've got power alongside And now the fourth one. We've got paradoxical power because power is a paradox. You learned all about power as an infant. You learned about the power of your muscles when you, you, you stood up. The power of balance when you took those first steps. And I can tell you for all the, the mothers that the second the child learns how to walk, you absolutely lose control over them. And then you learned or you thought you learned you had power over others. We call those the terrible twos. No, I'm not going to do that. It's mine. Some people pick a career so they can exercise power over others. So power needs to be handled paradoxically. Jesus said what? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we think, no, not me, no. Uh-huh, I'm not gonna be meek. You know what happens to a guy who's meek? Ends up shopping in Hobby Lobby on Saturday. The word meek 
means power under control. Blessed are the ones who have power under control, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. Our power is paradoxical. It doesn't come from us. It comes from above. It's to be used not to lord it over people, but to serve people. Paul put it this way. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who, being, who are being saved, it is the power of God, the dunamis of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation, it says through the foolishness of preaching, to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power, the dunamis of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many are powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He's the source of your life in Christ Jesus who became for us the wisdom of God and the righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The power of God that comes from above, the power of God that comes from below, the power of God that walks beside us is a paradoxical power because it comes from one who says, if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. And if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. He gives us power to glorify him, to honor him, to serve him as we serve each other. I think for us, that should work. Would you stand and pray with me? We thank you, O oh God, for the families from which we come. We thank you for the families that gave us our names and the families into which we were baptized. We pray, O oh God, that as members of the family of God, we would live in such a way that we honor the name of Christ in all we do, in all we think, and in all we say. We pray in his name. Amen.